I was going to wear an anti-racist uniform for this video, but I don't want to give them any more publicity. Today we're talking about critical race theory. The 1776 Commission was an advisory committee established in 2020 by President Trump to support what he called patriotic education, but was later terminated by Joe Biden once he became president. Full disclosure, the 1776 commission was one of the reasons I decided to drop my Trump derangement syndrome and ultimately vote for Orange Man. And while many critics of the commission found it riddled with historical inaccuracies in an attempt to downplay the racist history of America, that was of no concern to me because I knew that the alternative would cause irreversible damage to society. I'm talking about the 1619 Project, which aims to reframe the country's history by placing consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the United States. The 1619 Project, or otherwise known as Critical Race Theory, is being described as diversity education for the workplace as well as schools. But I'm here, to tell you that that is complete bullshit. To put it bluntly, critical race theory is indoctrination disguised as education. It's literal brainwashing with the promises to examine social, cultural, and legal issues as they relate to race and racism. You know that saying they sold you a lemon, meaning you drop some dough on a car only to find out that it's a piece of crap? The engine stalls, the brakes fail, it's all corroded on the inside. And that's what critical race theory is. It's a disaster with a little bit of polish and a used air freshener, so it entices you just enough before the buyer's remorse sets in. If you're familiar with my channel, then you know that I made quite a few pieces regarding racism because, well, that was the only topic of discussion some people were capable of having in 2020. Everything's racist, that's harmful, white supremacy this, systemic racism that. I don't know about you, but that's a little unusual to see society personally invested and consumed with one particular topic. We've all got lives to live, families to feed, so what rational reason is racism a code red priority all of a sudden? The reality is, is that racism does exist. Yes, it does. Always has and always will. And understanding that has allowed me to pick and choose my battles so I don't waste my energy trying to remedy something that's out of my control, especially if I'm not in any danger. And no, hurt feelings don't count. With that being said, as I mentioned in my Race Hustler video, as well as my reading from Manning Johnson's book, racial agitation has always been used as a tool to generate revenue and worse, motivate communist revolutions. This is one of the reasons that I encourage people to embrace live and let live principles, because once you realize that something is out of your control, such as defeating racism, it will be easier to spot those who are trying to take advantage of you by selling you a fantasy. I'd like to think of 2020 as a giant game of telephone. It started with COVID and somehow along the way we ended up on the topic of white supremacy to the point that people can't stop talking about it. Which is understandable considering how often virtuous keyboard warriors constantly label everyone and their mother as white supremacists, I can see how the illusion of a more racist country has come to fruition. But realistically, how many interactions have you had with a white supremacist lately? And be honest. Hostile, by the way. I don't care about your hurt feelings, and I don't care what you think they believe or what principles they hold. What have they done to negatively impact your life, excluding feelings directly? Not your friend, not someone you follow on Twitter, you. Because I'll tell you what, I'm more apprehensive about walking through a BLM rally than I am living amongst potential white supremacists. But going back to my original point, racial tensions will always be exploited as long as people continue to focus on things they cannot change. The civil rights movement is over, meaning that black Americans have the same rights and resources, yes I said resources, as every other American. There is a certain level of personal responsibility that every person should have, so no, I don't buy the idea that your Pantone shade determines your quality of life, at least not in 2021, that is, assuming we can stop this new diversity training in its tracks. So, 
Let's get into this. What is critical race theory and why should every single parent be concerned about it? To help answer these questions, I've invited some friends to share some insights on the topic. We're going to start with the spokesperson for Color Us United and host of the Pensive Politics podcast, Christian Watson, who's going to help us understand what critical race theory is and where it came from. Take it away, Christian. Well, one of the biggest things that people really need to understand about critical race theory is 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 two things actually. You need to understand number one, how is it used by the left to accrue political political power, and number two, how does it fit into the entire viewpoint that many leftist organizations like Black Lives Matter and general leftists have. So these two very things are important because if we don't understand how critical race theory is used or what ideology it emerges from, how in the world can we actually dissect it intellectually? Actually, we can't. So I want you to imagine this. A lot of left-leaning ideologies pride the idea of egalitarianism, simply meaning that they want to have a society where there is equality for all in terms of opportunity uh, and in terms of outcome as well. Whenever you hear a leftist say, I want to have, I want people to have fair housing, or I want people to have free health care, what they really are saying is that I want to have an egalitarian society. So an egalitarian society v views every single thing through a single lens. And that single lens is through equity. That single lens is through the idea of having this broad access to everything else. Now, you can have an egalitarian belief system without actually having critical race theory, but what has happened is, ever since the 70s when Kimberly Crenshaw and a few of her compadres um, you know, used the methods from the Frankfurt School, which established critical theory to create critical race theory, the sort of egalitarian idea of the left has been paired with an obsession with power and privilege. And that is what critical race theory is. It is this idea that you can reduce um, relations in society, especially relations insofar as they concern race with power and privilege. So that means, as Kimberly Crenshaw once put it in an interview, that instead of seeing a black girl and her problems as indicative of her individual circumstances, it's seeing the black girl and her problems as a culmination of the various circumstances that go into being a woman, that go into being black, and that go into being her particular socioeconomic circumstance. And how can you do this? Through intersectionality theory, which is inherently influenced by critical race theory. So what have we learned? The egalitarian idea of the left has been paired with critical race theory, and both of them have in common a sort of single-minded tunnel vision by which they view everything with. And so this single-minded tunnel vision is used to bring this idea of heaven onto earth. Why do you think Black Lives Matter, the, the organization, even and even the phrase, why do you think both of those things proclaim to speak for all black people? It's the same single-minded narrowness of the general idea of critical race theory. It's the same single-minded narrowness of the general idea of everything in society being reduced to power and privilege. Critical race theory is not just this interesting rhetorical device that occurs in academia somewhere that has a, a weird-sounding name. No, no, no. Critical race theory is quite literally the tool that is being used to justify through an academic way, quote unquote academic way, whatever that means these days, um, you know, some absurd ideas. It is not scientific. It is not rigorous. It quite literally views everything in society as being caused by power or being caused by not having power or whatever. It's be it, a single purpose. And for that very reason alone, it should not necessarily be taken seriously as an ideal, but it should be taken seriously as a looming threat to all of our individualities, as a looming threat to the promise that many of us are, are are guaranteed, not just as Americans, but as people who live in the West, which is so complex and diverse. Next up, I'm going to hand the mic over to organizational psychologist and unwoke activist Dr. Carlin Borisenko, who's actively fighting to stop critical race theory from being integrated in education as well as workplace diversity training. Let's look at some ways in which critical race theory can manifest inside the classroom. What we have here are slides from an actual high school course called Sociology of Change that was a required course in order to graduate. It taught students that 
people of color cannot be considered racist because racism equals power plus prejudice, and therefore, because people of color don't have power, they cannot be racist. It taught that the traditional family reinforced racist and homophobic stereotypes, and it required students who may present as white, even if they had a non-white parent, to admit that they were inherent oppressors because of their association with whiteness. A school system in New York actually sent this slide home to parents that encouraged parents to become white traitors as opposed to white supremacists. White traitor is considered a good thing because that means you are doing the anti-racist work to fight back against your inherent whiteness. The University of New Hampshire, of course, a publicly funded institution, gave a training program that taught white people that their role is to shut up and accept what is being taught to you in this anti-racist critical race theory ideology without questioning it. And if you question it, if you dare to push back on it at all, that is only proof of your further racism. The school district in Manchester, New Hampshire forced all of its teachers and its, and its staff to undergo anti-racist training, including webinars about their white privilege. And if you're wondering how the school systems treat biracial students, students who might have one white parent and one non-white parent, here's the answer for you. What they train the teachers to do is to teach the students to not identify with the white part of themselves, to only identify with the non-white part of themselves. And the reason that they do that is because the white part of themselves is considered to be the oppressor, whereas the non-white part of themselves is considered to be oppressed. So they're not supposed to identify with the oppressor, and you can imagine how that might impact, let's say, their relationship with that, that white parent. These are actual slides from an eighth grade classroom in which 14-year-old students were taught that if they believe the Pledge of Allegiance, if they believe in fairness and justice for all, well, that just makes sense then that they would have to become social justice warriors and they would have to pursue equity. And the teacher in the course of instructing this class actually taught them that equity was significantly better than equality because equality didn't really give people everything that they needed, but equity did. Equity gave everyone what they individually needed in order to be successful, and it taught the students that if they want to be good people, then they need to fight back against systemic racism in all walks of life. Now, they were never, of course, allowed to question how much of an impact systemic racism actually had. They were just supposed to follow along and agree with the ideology. And after they were done with that, the students got to play a rousing game of oppression bingo, where they were forced to identify the different areas of privilege that they might have to include both parents went to college, being white, being Christian, never being racially profiled, feel represented in media, feeling safe around police officers, and getting driven to school. This is from a website from a high school in Holderness, New Hampshire, in which the high school actively admits, we will integrate concepts of social justice, specifically notions of empathy and fairness in education throughout our curriculum. So when social justice is being integrated into curriculum, what's gonna happen is we're gonna start seeing things like what's happening in Virginia. Virginia high schools are actually starting to eliminate advanced placement math courses because too many white students are in them. Boston has done the same thing. They are eliminating advanced placement courses because they don't believe that there is enough diversity in those courses, and therefore it is racist to even offer those courses in the first place. These ideas are not just being integrated in, in ways that you might expect by being taught as kind of alongside the curriculum. They are being integrated in courses all across the system to include English, drama, history, science, mathematics. Students are no longer learning how to read and write. They're learning how to be little social justice warriors. And then maybe if they learn how to read or write on top of it, that's an extra added bonus. I wish the examples that Dr. Carlin shared was a joke, but they're not. And if you still think that this education is beneficial after watching that clip, let's do a little experiment. Swap the words white with black and let me know how it sounds. I don't care what you believe the intentions for critical race theory is. How does it sound when the roles are reversed? Does it sound racist? Does it promote bigotry by generalizing a specific demographic? Or better yet, what do you think the response will be after someone is vilified for their skin color? Any sensible person can see that adding racism on top of racism doesn't actually fix racism. 
MLK said that we should judge people based on the content of their character, while critical race theory does the complete opposite of that by viewing blackness as victims and whiteness as oppressors. At the beginning of this video, I told you that racial agitation has always been used as a tool to not only generate revenue for race hustlers, but also motivate communist revolutions. I recently had an interview with Lily Tang Williams, who's a Chinese immigrant that was born and raised during Mao's Cultural Revolution, where an estimated 20 million people died due to his policies. And in that interview, she describes how the communist regime brainwashed people in a similar fashion that critical race theory is currently doing. I'm gonna play a clip from a recent rally in New Hampshire where Lily's been fighting to stop the critical race theory indoctrination. Here's that clip. The New Hampshire bill prevents certain divisive concepts based on race and sex from spreading in state contracts, grants, and training programs. One of the bill's sponsors is Republican Representative Keith Ammon, who spoke at a rally on Saturday. He addresses some of the criticism of the bill he is trying to advance in the state's house. The opponents of the bill are they're outright lying about what the bill does. They're saying silly, ridiculous things about it. It'll prevent teaching of women's suffrage or the Holocaust or, or the history of slavery in the U.S. All that is bunk. It's all just a smoke screen. You know, don't listen to it because you, if you just read the bill, you can see that all those things are not true. Critical race theory has roots in Marxism. Proponents of the theory see race, gender, and other identities as social constructs that support systems of oppression, according to the Heritage Foundation. But one of the rally attendees, Lily Tang Williams, warns Americans about the theory. She highlights similarities between the theory and tactics Mao Zedong used to gain power during the Cultural Revolution in China. In Cultural Revolution, they divided people into five reds and five black classes, right? And they, they in critical race theory, and they divided people into oppressor groups and uh, oppressed groups. So if you're white, male, and uh, you know, um, question conservatives, and then you belong to oppressors groups. So I just don't like that division because it sounds familiar to me. It, it's just divide and conquer. Another attendee who goes by Barbara from Harlem speaks out against critical race theory. This critical race theory is not based on any godly principles. It's man-made, it's made up, and it teaches racism. You know, they act like this country is so racist you can't make it here. Well, you know, tell people like Oprah that you can't make it here. Le LeBron James, all of these people are living very successful lives because of the opportunities here in America. The bill effectively bans the theory by prohibiting dissemination of concepts in certain state government communications that say one race or sex is inherently superior to another, or that New Hampshire or the United States is inherently racist. The bill is currently in the state Senate. As the reporter mentioned and what Lily explained during our interview is that critical race theory has roots in Marxism. And if you've been paying attention, Black Lives Matter founders already proclaimed that they're trained Marxist, which is a social, political, and economic philosophy intended to overturn capitalism in favor of communism. Now, if BLM's distaste for the nuclear family didn't bother you, or if the lack of transparency about their donations didn't bother you, or even the eerie similarities to Mao's struggle sessions during last year's peaceful protests didn't bother you, then perhaps this recent clip of BLM founder Patrice Connors will. I was at the, our publications table today, and I was speaking to this uh, young person from Arizona who's trying to fight uh, SB 1070. And I was, he, he, he grabbed the book and he said, it's like Mal's Red Book. And I was like, man, that's what I was thinking. And it was just really cool to hear him make that connection. I was like, how about you buy like 10 to 15 of these books and you all have like a youth like organizing group where you talk about it and you really try to engage this. And we can just kind of, we need to build off of this. And so that leads me to um, a point that I, I actually wanted to kind of focus on today which is, um, I think I have a, a really important role in speaking to youth. I, I have, maybe it's because I came in the movement at 17 and a half, so I have like just a knack for knowing how to organize young people into this organization and kind of teach them this, this politic and then hear them now organize other people. So let's summarize what we just heard. Patrice said that someone complimented her book saying that it was comparable to Mao's Red Book. Yes. 
Mao, the same dictator that not only enslaved Lily, but was also responsible for millions of deaths due to his ideas. People died from mass starvation. Children were brainwashed. Society was pit against one another. Civilians were promised a utopia of wealth and equity, but ended up equally poor instead. So excuse me if I'm skeptical about someone's intentions to do good when they follow the literal playbook of a man that inspired some of the most heinous atrocities in human history. If people are willing to go back 400 years to use black slavery as justification for critical race theory, then people should be equally as motivated to educate themselves on the history of communism so they'll know what Marxist indoctrination looks like. Critical race theory is literal brainwashing that will further the already mental enslavement of a lot of black America by promoting victimhood and encouraging people to abandon their individuality for the sake of a collective. And if you've watched my previous video titled Not Black Enough, then you should already understand the dangers that follow collectivism. And before I forget, it's worth mentioning that critical race theory isn't the only problem. In fact, anti-racism is a subgroup of critical race theory. Self-proclaimed anti-racist use methods of critical race theory to substantiate their points. I say this because there seems to be a lack of understanding from educators and BLM allies who seem to think that anti-racism is a solution for ending racism. No boo boo, anti-racism simply redirects the racism. And we can see that by looking at a few quotes from Dr. Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Here's the first one. There is no neutrality in the racism struggle. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is not an in-between safe space of not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. So what you're saying is, is if I randomly were to point at a white person and call them a racist with no proof, and they responded by telling me that's not true, that somehow confirms that they are in fact racist? Are you fucking kidding me? Not only is this nonsensical garbage, it also proves just how much perfection these types of folks demand. There will always be individuals who say things intentionally or unintentionally to hurt your feelings. Racist or not, it's called life. Civil rights activists fought to give black people the same rights as everyone else in America. So I find it tone deaf that we have a generation of people complaining about microaggressions. And this idea that a person isn't allowed to defend themselves after being accused of something so heinous is a cultish mindset that will inevitably discriminate against a specific group of people. Yes, that's a grand idea. Manufacturing division has always worked great in history. Moving on, here's another painful quote from Kendi's book. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy of past discrimination is present discrimination. So you're telling me that it's okay for me to discriminate as long as you're doing it for what you think is a good cause. That's what you're saying. Well, if that's the case, since a lot of people seem to think that BLM is a legitimately good cause, I'd like to discriminate against everyone who blindly advocates for the Marxist Trojan horse. Would that be okay? No! Of course it's not, because conversation is the only thing stopping us from coming up with actual solutions. So as much as it irritates me to know how many people fell for the movement because they didn't do their research, I understand that the past is immutable, unlike Dr. Kendi, who apparently thinks that we can fix the past by causing more problems in the present. Does that honestly sound coherent to you? And if educators claim to care about the advancement of black people, then they shouldn't promote education that encourages their students to believe that their skin color summarizes their life experience or that a black kid will forever be viewed as a second class citizen. That's a feeling. That's not something rooted in factual evidence. It's almost like a teenager studying for an exam, but instead of their parents wishing them luck, they say, why bother? You probably won't pass anyway. Well, with that mindset, why bother trying at all? 
I have seen how this type of rhetoric holds people back. I have seen what it can do to stifle someone's perseverance. I know how much it can destroy someone's confidence to believe that all of their downfalls are the result of racial discrimination. And it blows my mind that we have educators pushing this delusion to their students and thinking that they're helping. Let me take you out of your safe space for just a second and remind you that genocide is something that's very real and still exists to this day. And you don't have to go very far in history to see that nothing positive has ever come from cultivating a them versus us mindset. If you truly wanna change the world for the better, we have to start with ourselves. And that involves thinking for ourselves and not allowing the government, the media or victim vendors to do the thinking for you. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more content like this. Also, be sure to sign up for my mailing list so we can stay connected. My name is Gothics and when I have kids someday, I'm probably going to homeschool them. I'll see you in the next one. Bye. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Now I have a dream that we will implement love, not hate, or supporting another Jim Crow's agenda. CRT is not an honest dialogue. It is a tactic that was used by Hitler and the Ku Klux Klan on slavery very many years ago to dumb down my ancestors so we could not think for ourselves. CRT is racist. It is abusive. It discriminates against one's color. Let me educate you. An honest dialogue does not impress, oppress. An honest dialogue does not implement hatred or injustice. It's to communicate with deceiving, without deceiving people. Today, we don't need your agreement. We want action in a backbone for what we asked for today to ban CRT. We don't want your political advertisement to divide our children or belittle them. Think twice before you indoctrinate such racist theories. You cannot tell me what is or is not racist. Look at me. I had to come down here today to tell you to your face that we are coming together and we are strong. This will not be the last. Greet and meet respectfully.